good morning, everyone. Welcome to day two of Iowa Ideas. Uh, this is session six, Rural Storm Recovery uh, under the infrastructure track. This is the first of two sessions this morning. And then uh, we'll have a closing keynote by David Kennedy from National Network for Safe Communities. That is from 11 to noon. And then from noon to one is the Big Ideas Virtual Socials. Pick a room, learn about initiatives from various groups, various groups and how you can get involved. And uh, from here, I will uh, hand it over to our moderator, Chelsea. Hi guys, welcome to Iowa Ideas Day 2. Um, we are just honestly waiting on one more panelist to come up, but I want to welcome everybody to Iowa Ideas Day 2. It has been an ultimate experience, guys. We um, had some awesome panels yesterday um, and have a half day today, which is great. Um, if For anybody that doesn't know me, I am Chelsea Greider. I am actually the events manager, so I am kind of the logistics guru on the back end of this and also got asked to moderate this session. Um, born and raised livestock crop production girl on a generational farm um, and also kind of an events manager, kind of have a double world in all honesty. So um, I want to welcome today Krista Wilson with Farm Credit Services and Sam Funk with Farm Bureau. Um, and we're still waiting on uh, Secretary of Agriculture, but we'll get started. Um, I want to welcome you guys today and thank you so much for sitting on this panel. We truly appreciate it. This um, this topic is near and dear to my heart as we were just talking kind of prequel to this. Um, so Krista, if you kind of want to give um, kind of a, a short little bio of what you do, um, who you are and all that good stuff. Sure. Thanks for having me today, Chelsea. I appreciate yeah. it. Uh, Krista Wilson, I am a Related Services Vice President at Farm Credit Services of America, Frontier Farm Credit. I'm based out of Eastern Iowa. I work in the DeWitt, Manchester and Cedar Rapids offices. So uh, with the role that I'm in, I have been a lending officer and now I lead our crop insurance team uh, in, in all three of those offices. Uh, born and raised in agriculture, uh, row crop, uh, and uh, sorry, cow-calf operation in Eastern Iowa, uh, close to the river, and um, have been invo involved in agriculture for my whole life. Um, Iowa State grad, animal science. <laughs> Yep. And um, just really happy to be here and um, just really work really hard every day to try to help customers find solutions and be as successful as possible. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chris, Krista. Sam, how about you? Well, Sam Funk and I'm with the Iowa Farm Bureau Federation. I've been on here for uh, a, a little bit of time right now already. It seems like the years fly, especially through some of these pandemic times. But uh, so actually uh, was not born in Iowa, did not matriculate from Iowa State University. Uh, so, but I did teach up at Iowa State University with William Edwards for farm management up there. Uh, so I'm the farm boy that stayed in school for a lot of years. So ended up with a PhD out of Kansas State University. Uh, spent a lot of time in some academic circles and working with uh, the broader world on uh, domestic use for soybeans and a lot of our other crops and uh, ended up here. And uh, so glad to be up here. Uh, so Chelsea and I had the discussion and, and apparently I have have met Chelsea before in a former life. Uh, and uh, that just tells you that the gray hair has actually allowed me to be in a lot of different places at a lot of times uh, and seen a lot of things. And, and frankly, because of that, we get to bring in a lot of experience. And I'm going to back away from here so that our esteemed secretary, uh, Mike Nag, can join us over here. So Yes, thanks, Sam. Mike, we just got started here. We're just doing some short kind of bios, all those good things. Um, so if you want to introduce yourself, that'd be great. Well, excellent. And I apologize for being just a little bit late. I, I had traveled and had a little bit of a technical issue this morning getting hooked up, but uh, uh, glad we can join and and uh, great to be uh, great to be with you. And, and I, I uh, appreciate all the different topics that are being covered uh, you know, throughout this, uh, the, the conference, and, and certainly this is an important one that's impacted uh, Iowa agriculture in, 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 in a number of ways. And so great to be here. Um, so Mike Neg, uh, Iowa Secretary of Ag, I'm from uh, West Iowa. I'm actually in Northwest Iowa this morning, um, and uh, we're finishing up our harvest. Western Iowa's been, uh, uh, I think, you know, uh, ahead of, uh, ahead of schedule. I know uh, we were a little drier than, than folks in Eastern Iowa, and so that's largely contributing to us being this far ahead. But yes, we're, we're done and, and uh, in the process of starting to button some things up for the year, which is amazing to be able to say that in mid-October. So great, great to be with you today. 
Thanks, Mike. No, definitely. I know it's kind of been a, it's been a different harvest in Eastern Iowa to say the least. I um, mean, that's it kind is. of the, perf- it's kind of the perfect tie into this. Um, you know, it's one of those things that it, there's a lot of concerns, especially for Eastern Iowa. Everyone knows August 10th, 2020 was, was kind of a catastrophic day. It started very normal. Um, and by noon, it was not to say the least. Right. Um, if you guys kind of want to talk about that day and kind of how it impacted you guys personally, but also kind of part of your guys' jobs. And you guys are all in that really kind of key parts of agriculture, obviously Secretary of Agriculture, Farm Bureau, and Iowa Farm Credit. Kind of talk about that day, guys. Well, well I'd be happy to I'd be happy to start. And, yeah. and certainly, uh, you know, um, and again, the, the, the folks that uh, have lived through it uh, know that it was unlike anything that they'd ever experienced before. And, and I think um, what, what I'll, I'll just kind of talk specifically about the agriculture experience here in that it's, it's not as if we're not used to dealing with adverse weather conditions every year in okay. agriculture. You, you expect to. Um, you know, we're dealing with a significant drought in, in a, a large parts of the, the state of Iowa this year. We had significant flooding last year, you know, um, wind and hail and, and even combining down corn is not a it's not a, a completely unheard of thing, um, but I think that the, the difference is, and as I brought some folks into the state, whether it's Secretary Purdue or Undersecretary Northey was in this past week or others, that um, what is different about this is the size, the scale, the severity of it all. The fact that a derecho was on the ground from Southern South Dakota to Western Ohio, 770 yeah. miles. The fact that you can drive from Carroll to Clinton and see down corn the whole way. Um, that's what's different. It's the, it's the scale of it all. And, um, and, and I think that's what's really taxing the system. So again, just the high level numbers, three and a half to 4 million acres of corn that were impacted, two and a half million acres of soybeans. The corn really took the brunt, the soybeans, not so much. Um, 60 million uh, bushels worth of, uh, of uh, commercial age damaged at least, and actually a significant more uh, a, a number of bushels that were incapacitated, meaning that you might have lost three out of five bins, but you couldn't use the two that were left because the structures around them were down. Um, at least that much on-farm storage loss. Uh, so very, very significant damage and obviously to homes and communities in the, in the path. And what that then results in is folks really having to struggle through trying to go out and figure out what to do with that downed crop and uh, work through the crop insurance claims and all that. So at a high level, that's what we, uh, we what we've seen. Yeah, Krista, Sam. Well, I'll just chime in and say that that morning, actually, I was on another video call, and uh, all of a sudden, the sky behind me turned exceptionally dark. Mm. The wind started to pick up, and it didn't take probably uh, just a handful of minutes before somebody who was uh, further to the east of me, I said, "Do you see this yet?" And all of a sudden it struck his place. Uh, so, you know, but uh, again, uh, let me go back to something, which is uh, what Mr. Secretary had just referenced. I think we've spent more time in meetings together and I've gotten to know him more in the last uh, several months with so many different times that we've had to communicate about different factors of what's impacting Iowa agriculture. It's yeah. been significant. Uh, this storm, uh, you know, some other people have said, well, we looked at 2019 and we said, wow, we can't wait to be out of 2019. And now all of a sudden it was, well, welcome to 2020. Uh, you know, a whole new set of uh, things that have obviously impacted Iowa agriculture and, and in ways that you know, we wish we wouldn't have had to have faced, but yet uh, it, it's it's shown the spirit and the strength that people have to be able to come together to address some of these issues uh, which have come forth. And, you know, we can say that we saw uh, materials that have flown from our farm uh, across Highway 169, which mm-hmm. Secretary Nag and I've talked about several times, the importance of, you know, what we see out there and uh, things flew about a mile away from our place across the road into a, you know, a field on the other side. Uh, it's, it's that kind of a time when things just, you know, it, it wasn't the same. We avoided some of the other uh, major damage that some people have had losing facilities, uh, you know, down crops around us. Actually, we got wind but we didn't have so many crops uh, down in the Madison County area that, uh, that were down. 
uh, but there was damage. And, and that's kind of the important aspect to realize that um, as, uh, Administrator Barbary with the Risk Management Agency had said at one point in time on a call, this is probably the single largest day impact that we are going to have for crop insurance in the history of crop insurance. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, I would agree with that 100%. Um, Sam, from that aspect, um, I can talk about the crops. Uh, it's unprecedented times. That's what we hear all the time is uh, it, it's nothing like we've ever seen before where you have 240 bushel corn at 10 o'clock and by 1030, you have zero. And that's exactly what some people had. Uh, it was flat. It was just absolutely destroyed. Um, so from that standpoint, it's very hard from a mental standpoint for producers to grasp a hold of what just happened. And um, I was sitting in DeWitt that day and had conversations with folks in Cedar Rapids uh, before the storm even hit DeWitt. And it was, it's, it's a wreck. It's, it's absolutely flat. It's gone. And um, by the time it hit DeWitt, it was maybe not as bad, but it was still very dark. It was something like I've not experienced before. I, I like Sam was on a Zoom call and didn't really realize until I looked out the window and all of a sudden it was, it was amazing as, uh, as to what you would see. Um, so from that standpoint, I'm also, um, from the crop insurance perspective, there's a lot of adjusters, but there's not enough adjusters for something like this. And also, the companies have never experienced this before either. So from an RMA perspective or from a crop insurance company perspective, this is all new. And so there has been a lot of conversation around um, maybe one company does something one way and one does another. Um, that, that's not intended by any means. It's just trying to figure out ex the best path following the rules and policies and procedures. Yeah, definitely. I I remember that day kind of as myself. I remember my mom came and picked up some, my daughter and I said, I remember calling my dad about 1230 and I was like, hey, how's the storm going? And he goes, Charles, I just saw the grain bin go over the house. And I go, I'm sorry, what? And he goes, I'm not, I'm not lying to you. He's like, and the top of the finishing unit is gone. And I'm like, okay, this thing is actually for real. And I remember getting to the basement and then our hundred foot pine tree was a foot from the house. And I'm like, this thing is unreal. And so, and I was telling uh, the crew kind of pre, pre this, you know, we, I grew up in Benton County and that's kind of one of the hardest hit all air, all areas were hit, but that just unimaginable when you see your home County, you hop on 30 and you head West and you see all of your friends and your family's generational farms, just, just destroyed. And I think it was unimaginable until we get out and we see that. So um, thank you for guys for sharing your stories. I know kind of everybody's kind of got their own thing and their own own family stuff but it's just it's unimaginable I think for anybody that didn't live and breathe and see it every day mm -hmm. um for that that first 12 hours when we when it happened so thank you guys um I think uh my uh director of secretary of agriculture said this um farmers have a lot of we were just talking about it, adequate storage for this year's harvest um because of the number of structures that were damaged and destroyed in the derecho um, with harvest actually happening now um, and with the soybeans and everything and what they can get out for some corn um, and some farmers doing, um, where, where is it going? What, what are they doing for that crop that they have no storage for? Yeah, so again, this is, this is sort of, uh, and I'm glad it was mentioned, here's the insult to injury part of this. In, in large swaths of the, of the area that was damaged by derecho, we were looking at good crops. Uh, we were looking at, you know, again, to the western part of the state, you were dealing with drought, more to the eastern part of the state, you were looking at really good looking uh, crops, and, and then it was, and, uh, <clears throat> and yet you can go out and pick some of that up. There's a couple things to think about. One is, um, you know, we're at, what, 700,000 or 700,000 acres, not that we do not expect to be harvested. I think that could grow uh, just by virtue of the fact that I was in Tama, Benton, and Lynn counties on Wednesday of this week with uh, with Secretary Northey, former Secretary Northey, and uh, you know you, you're talking to folks who are going out and making an attempt to pick up some of that corn and, and realizing it, it just can't be done, mm -hmm. or it can't be done in a way that's acceptable uh, given the wear and tear on the equipment and time and that sort of thing. And so I think that number could go up. Now the other piece is quality. Grain quality is the other thing that we would think about when that corn's laying down close to the ground. It you know gets damp. It, there's no airflow around it. It doesn't dry down. But I will tell you that that's been one of the 
oh, ironically, we would say one of the good parts about how dry it's been is that the grain quality issues just aren't appearing like we would think because that too would contribute to some of those storage issues. So um, uh, you've got uh, the commercial grain facilities are working hard to, one, they had to tear down the damaged equipment, assess what could still be used. And then they've been working like mad uh, to uh, either, you know, in some cases rebuild, but mostly repair and get operational what was left. Uh, you've got some, of course, outside, you know, temporary on the ground storage. That's not an unusual thing in the state of Iowa. I think we will see more of that. Uh, and then you're seeing farmers do, uh, do creative things like, well, maybe you use an old grain bin or, or potentially uh, uh, put uh, some bags, uh, store some, some grain in bags, but uh, make no mistake, uh, uh, the storage piece of this is one of those compounding factors that uh, really is challenging folks. You know, one of the aspects of that one, and we heard from some of our uh, grain handlers, is that they said we would go out and be putting, getting ready to put grain into a facility and then realize we had more damage than what we knew about in the first place. Yeah. Uh, so you've got a lot of challenges that come in through there that because it happened so close to them getting ready for harvest, that it was really when the harvest started to challenge those facilities that they realized some of the extent. So uh if you think about, you know, part of this whole aspect, and so you can't take any of these uh, events in isolation. And part of what's happened here recently is we've actually had a lot of uh, improvement in looking for exporting of grains and oil seeds. So all of a sudden we started to see some basis levels, which started trying to pull more and more grain uh, away in, in a rather rapid fashion. And if there's if there's a blessing that can come along with a curse, uh, maybe that's it, is that we get to move some of that product uh, immediately going into export channels and it's being uh, pulled away and, and that's great. Now, we've seen something that's happened here again, which is the fact that there's still a lot of demand in the interior, even for Iowa, that uh, we're seeing some basis levels improve actually right here. So they're saying, hey, we need part of this grain to stay right here yes. because we've got such a dynamic uh, animal feeding industry. The ethanol industry is hopefully going to be able to pick back up more volume as well. Uh, if we see people starting to travel, starting to, you know, have more demand for uh, fuels, then we can pick up that demand for uh, biodiesel and for ethanol back in here as well. And, and we really need everything coming in together to try to get out of what had been a much larger picture, which uh, this terrific windstorm as itself was just one part of this broader year. So there's a lot of factors that are going to be moving together that hopefully help us to be able to get out of the current doldrums and try to pick up uh, some of that financial spirit for agriculture in the state. Yeah, I would agree 100% there. And th the other thing that is, there's a lot of folks who are feeding livestock, um, have finishing buildings, those kind of things, and their crop also was gone. Mm -hmm. So you may have the opportunity to sell to your neighbors, um, actually utilize some of the storage that stayed as far as the co-ops and those kind of things. But I would agree with Sam as far as the markets helping us in this this time so that maybe you weren't planning to sell your crop or you usually stored your crop in the fall, but now you have an, at least an opportunity to have a, a um, attractive price to sell to um, a processor or something like that. So from that standpoint, I think that that's helped. Um, what I'm hearing is it could be two to three years before some of these bins are rebuilt or some of these co-ops are, are reconstructed because of COVID and the lack of materials and those kind of things. So I, I don't know that it's just a 2020 issue when it comes mm -hmm. to um, the storage piece. Yep. I think it's probably two to three more years after that. And, and that's what people need to plan for and kind of be thinking about is it's not just 2020, but what happens for the years to come as well. Yeah, definitely, Krista. That was actually, that's, that's a perfect wrap up, but that's kind of what we've been hearing. I mean, like I just said, we lost two or three grain bins and they're like, well, I said, it might, it might be a few years and we're, we're all kind of, it's a little, I think that af the aftermath after we get past this, I think people are going to have to expect that. Thank you for that. Um, guys, if it wasn't storage facilities, it was livestock barns, it was operations, it was pastures, it, all this stuff, um, storage equipment, you know, Morton buildings, all that stuff for equipment. What have you been hearing about the damage on equipment side of things? Um, you know, for example, we had our bean head completely destroyed because it was, you know, in our Morton building, um, couldn't get parts for it because of COVID. Um, what are you guys seeing coming kind of down the pipeline of how um, people are doing for that kind of aspect to get through harvest what they can? 
I'll let somebody else go first this time. You know, I don't need to jump in every time. So maybe I'll let, uh, maybe I'll let Sam or Krista jump in and I'll close out. Uh, but yeah, you guys go Definitely. ahead. Sure. Um, I can start. Oh, go, go ahead, ahead Sam. Krista. Yeah. Nope. Nope. You were going to go ahead. So I just said, wow. <laughs> um, from that standpoint, um, it's all over the board. The thing that is different about this is usually if you had a tornado or something like that, your neighbors would come help you, right? Totally. Your neighbors are in the same boat and there's not enough help to go around um, as far as cleanup is concerned when you talk about the trees and the buildings and the bends in the field, those kind of things. But we're seeing where there's bends in the field. So that's a deterrent for you to even go get that crop, right? Like how do I even go get that out of there, that debris out of the field to go do that? to go actually harvest my crop. Um, it's more than just if it was in a Morton shed, it's trying to actually combine this crop mm -hmm. wearing on equipment significantly. Like, I don't know how many snoots that some people have told me that they have, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, already been through the reels that they've put on their combine, uh, yeah. just the debris that's gone through that. And, and then you add that on top of the fact that their buildings have been destroyed or they can't get their equipment inside. Um, it, it's significant. I, I don't even know how to put a value or a number on that. I think it's just, it's more than just the barn flew away or the bin totally. left. It's more than that. So I'll leave it at that. Well, there's only so much you can get by flying a drone over a field when the corn is laying down over something and hiding everything. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so you've got a lot of challenges that have kind of uh, it made this a more exasperating experience. And I like what Secretary Nag had brought up earlier, which is the fact that some of the additional time and cost for being able to get uh, these fields harvested is really creating a drag. Uh, right. for a lot of producers out through there. And this isn't the normal, you know, the normal speed that many of them, I, I, I saw some fields that people were going into at angles that I was never going to think they were going to enter those fields. Uh, and yes. and mm -hmm. what are you going to do? Uh, you know, uh, you get the adjuster out there. They're telling you what you have. Uh, you accept it and move on or do you wait? It's like, wow. Uh, you know, the choices that some people had, uh, you know, it was brought up earlier thinking about some of the uh, looking at what happens with the livestock producers who are looking at putting that feed in there. And does it create a demand for other people who can sell grain? Yes, but that's one more cost for that producer. Uh, that's probably more trips. That's more uh, expense that they're going to have to go in through there. So th the hidden cost of the storm, there's definitely hidden costs uh, to the storm and a lot of things that we can talk about that go uh, more extensive into that uh, same regard. I, I, I completely agree with the, the comments, you know, those, those, uh, um, those uncovered costs, right? Those uninsured losses. Uh, uh, yes, the good news is, is that, you know, most, most of our farmers 95 plus percent of Iowa farmers carry crop insurance. It's a great thing. It's such an important program. And it's re times like this that we're reminded of how important that that risk management tool is. Um, and yet, you know, just as we talked about, you go go out and you run a combine one direction at a mile and a half or two miles an hour and you put a reel on and and you, you bend up a couple of snoots and you take the extra time. And, you know, those are not costs that are covered. Uh, all of that. I, I, those are, that's, those are all real. And those are things that people are dealing with, you know, this, in terms of structural damage, I, I you know, I, I, uh, um, it, it is interesting. I've traveled a lot in the area to see how the wind blew around certain sites and what was impacted and what's not. You almost get to a point where you say, why in the world is that still standing versus the next place that I saw where it wasn't. And, uh, I think there's just some really interesting patterns around that. Uh, lots of sheds, lots of bins. Um, you know, some of the heartbreaking things of I was I've been on farms where the they lost the the barn that had been there. It's a century farm, and they'd lost mm -hmm. the barn. Um, those are those are heartbreaking things uh, because it's not just the building. Uh, there's a lot of history there. But I'll tell you, and I, this has been something I don't know what this has caught my attention. Um, the first farm that I that I visited after on that Tuesday. Uh, was a heritage farm, a farm that I'm going to give out some Century and Heritage Farm Awards today up in Palo Alto County. I love doing these. We usually do these at the fair. Can't yep. do, didn't do that this year. And so we're doing them across the state. Uh, heritage farm, a, you know, a four square 
farmhouse that was built in 1908. Lots of damage on the farm, and that house is just standing just as strong and proud as can be. And then I started to look at that when I traveled around the area. Oh, there's some good old houses that are out there standing just as proud as can be. Um, and so you think uh, instantly I put, tried to put this into context of there's been good weather and bad weather. There's been good markets and bad weathers, uh, you know, bad, bad, bad markets, boom years and bust years. Um, you know, this is a challenging one, but when you lay it all across the history and the tradition of Iowa agriculture, you know, we will get through this. Uh, but I am confident that this will be a time that we do talk about years from now as being that 2020 and, and what was the impact. It is historical. It is on that that scale uh, that people will talk about this 50 and 100 years from now. No, definitely. Um, and it's very true what you say. It's it's kind of very, it's very interesting when you do travel across and you're like, mm -hmm. why is that standing? But that's mm -hmm. not standing. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't what add happened? up. Yes. It doesn't add up. So yeah, I, I agree with you. It's been, it's been very interesting as we've kind of traveled throughout um, Iowa here lately. Um, talking about uncovered cost. I mean, you guys nailed it on the head. Um, I am, for example, my brother is a seed salesman, but he also is a salesman um, of Case IH and all that great stuff. They have seen so many snoots come through that are damaged, equipment that is damaged with foreign material going through it, you know, going only one, one mile an hour, trying to get something out. Where, what type of programs or how can they cover on, you know, re kind of cover those costs that are, that are unimaginable right now that they didn't even think about? Well, I'll start because, you know, and this is that back and forth that's happening in terms of the crop space right now. Um, Again, you know, again, crop insurance is a good thing. It's a, uh, it's something we're used to dealing with. And typically, you know, most years you get a drought year. Um, it, there's no question. You're going to go out and you're going to harvest what you can. And then you'll take the claim based on that. Well, you do that because the corn is standing at least, right? It may, it may be dry and it may be reduced yield, but it's standing. This is different. Uh, mm -hmm. I think it was noted earlier. Uh, Krista maybe said, you know, we don't have enough adjusters in the area. And there are folks coming into the area from out. This behaved more like a hurricane uh, than, than anything else. And, yep. and we don't have experience with that kind of damage. And so uh, there have been, frankly, very uh, candidly, there have been issues uh, around getting those fields adjusted. And yes, it's, it, it truly is a field by field uh, basis. And it is true that one field across the fence row from another really can be a completely different situation. I've seen it. Um, but there's lots of situations where, my, you know, where across the fence line, it isn't different. And yet they're being adjusted differently using different standards by different companies. And those are the things that we're trying to level out, right? The, the consistency is what we're concerned about. So uh, that was part of having Secretary Sonny Purdue out in, in September to see some of that. We had the, the RMA administrator, Risk Management Agency Administrator, Martin Barbary. Uh, uh, Sam mentioned that uh, Martin was out last week. He heads crop insurance. He's a farmer from Southern Illinois. He's got a grain reel. He's got a corn head reel in his shed in Southern Illinois. So he's done this. And you get, you get Martin out in fields and you introduce him to some of our farmers. He instantly understood the frustration. Secretary mm -hmm. Northey in the state this week, again, he oversees, he's Martin's boss. Um, Bill knows Iowa agriculture, obviously, but again, to get out and to see it for yourself. Um, so those are things, that's USDA's job in my estimation is they should be, trying to work for consistency. And yet we all have to understand that it is on a field by field basis. But, but my first conversation with USDA the day after was around two things. One was around, we shouldn't make farmers go out and make and have to harvest this crop. Uh, even if, you know, if it, if it's a total loss, don't make them go out and try to get a bushel just because that's what, you know, just, just for uh, form over function. Right. Uh, then the second was quality. We've got to take grain quality into consideration. Again, thankfully that hasn't played out, but uh, those were the first two things that I raised and we've continued to talk about that in the, in the subsequent months. But uh, all of that has to be considered in that crop insurance claim because you shouldn't have to go out and wreck them combine uh, a four, 300, $400,000 machine uh, by running dirt and rocks and debris through it because just because uh, the insurance company says, well, go, go harvest it and then we'll see what we're dealing with afterwards. That, that's not right. And, uh, and yet there are fields that will, that should be and need to be harvested and yep, it's hard, but that's also just kind of how, how it works, but we're looking for balance there. Definitely. Sam, Krista, anything to add to that? 
I think Mr. Secretary did a fine job of being able to <laughs> capitalize uh, what's gone on through there. I mean, obviously, there are challenges that are going to continue out through there. And the first thing that, you know, when we had a, a, a call with RMA and, and the team through there was to talk about the fact of we do have an extensive amount of coverage for our corn and soybeans across the state of Iowa. And that's one of those great aspects where producers have for a long time champion to have those risk management uh, programs in place. There will be another hidden loss, mm -hmm. which is the fact that several were looking at having some record yields. And, you know, let's, I use the example, if your APH is 180 and you thought you were right. going to be able to harvest at 220, but all of a sudden you're only able to harvest it, you know, at uh, uh, 190, you still had a loss. You had a loss. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt. But at the same time, you're not going to get paid for that loss because your APH was still covered. So at that point in time, there is something, and that will be that continuing into the multi-year because that year is not going to be able to go into your calculation to have a higher yield going into your APH for future years either. Now, here's the thing. Hope springs eternal. You plant a seed in the ground, you're expecting it to die to be able to give you a crop uh, for that year. And it will continue to be that way that you will have these um, optimists going out there to, to farm again the next year. Um, genetics have shown us that they've been able to create a crop that can withstand a lot of things, maybe not sustained, uh, you know, high mileage winds, but at the same time, uh, next year's yields uh, with corn and soybeans could be bumper again. And, and that's the important part that we need to continue to make sure that we have strong markets and that we are resilient in agriculture to be able to once again, take on that challenge to be able to provide for the world's needs. Yeah, I'll just uh, maybe talk a little bit about the same thing that Sam did, but um, there's also the fact of how does this year affect your APH for the next 10 years, right, Sam? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think you alluded to that, but also making sure that you have the right structures in place because the RMA is working to have um, some things in place for quality issues, as well as mm -hmm. if you don't have those yields and those kind of things. The other thing is, is um, there's always other options that you can purchase. So we have a lot of folks who do extra harvest expense on their crop mm -hmm. hail policy. Mm -hmm. And from that standpoint, that will help them for going one way or kind of um, the extra fuel that they're utilizing, mm -hmm. the suits that they have to replace, those kind of things. There's always those uncovered um, expenses like we talked about, but there might be a few avenues that aren't, it's not gonna help you gain all of those uncovered costs back, but there might be a few avenues that you can utilize to help going forward. That doesn't help you for 2020, but it also makes you realize maybe that's an avenue that we need to look at for going forward, but also to make sure that you have things structured correctly so that you can benefit the most from your crop insurance. I think that's probably the most important piece of that. I, I would like, to, I, I, that's a really good point if I can jump in here. Uh, look, the, yeah. you know, um, it, it's, a, it's an important reminder that you, you, you shouldn't just have your crop insurance on autopilot, right? Um, right. To, to really mm -hmm. understand what that policy says and these these add-on policies these riders that you can these these products that you can use you know some will make sense for you some won't maybe you don't want the added cost but but i think it is a a very important reminder as you say doesn't help you for this year uh but i think as you have that conversation with your crop insurance provider in in, in for 21 uh it, it maybe maybe this is just one of those times where you say okay what did we learn and, and shame on us if we collectively all of us that's not just saying farmers need to learn but that everybody insurance providers adjusters rma everyone needs to really look in on this event as sam said one of the largest uh we think claims events uh for for risk management uh, crop insurance so there will be things to learn. I suspect there will be policy things that need to change at the RMA level. And I know that there'll be some, some things that can be done better uh, to help folks understand what that policy looks like from that farmer to, to agent uh, conversation. Well, just an important factor. One of the first things that Administrator Barbary mentioned to us was the fact that I hope people had other policies other than just federal crop insurance to be able to add on to it. And that's the thing is some of those policies will add on to what federal crop had. But this is the important aspect of farmers taking on these risk management programs and they are paying uh, premiums out there. Why do they do that? Because in a bad year, you want to be able to lessen the risk that you might lose uh, more than you would otherwise. So it, it's that whole aspect of making sure that we have these risk management programs in place. And there's a 
this, if you will, this personal responsibility to understand what is my best option going forward and working with everyone, whether it be my ag lenders and everybody else who's going to be important mm-hmm. into that decision and coming together and making sure that you've got something that you put that program in place that will allow you to continue to operate. Well, and Sam, the Iowa State Extension and the, the, the decision maker tool, those are going to be really important things. I have to tell you, part of me wants to say, I want to put 2020 in a box shove it on the shelf and never think about it again and uh, just learn nothing from it. And I know that that's not right. You know, that there, we need to, we really do need to peel it back and look and dig in and, and learn the lessons, but let's just hope that we don't have another one like this any, anytime soon, or at least in our lifetime. Well, let's hope they're all better. There you go. <laughs> Definitely. I, don't even wish, I won't wish for normal anymore. I just want better. <laughs> I don't know what, right. I don't know what normal is anymore. I just want better. Right. I just want to add one, one piece to that is, it has to be very specific to your operation as far as what type of coverage you have and whether it's for your PNC, your crop insurance, whatever it is, you can't do the same thing that your neighbor does. You have mm-hmm. to do what is very specific to your operation based on how you're leveraged, um, what what you have for assets, those kind of things. So um, it's very important to analyze that every year and not just keep doing the same thing or doing what your neighbor does. I think that's a pretty important piece to remember. Definitely. Thank you, Krista. Um, kind of going back to Krista, actually, I, I kind of have this question built in. With being farm credit and all those great things, do you see more loans being take out, taken out after the derecho to help cover that mm-hmm. stuff? Or what are, what are you seeing? Or what are your concerns going into 2021? Um, farm credit. Sure. Um, I don't know if we know yet, because people are still trying to figure out what their crop is, um, exactly what their damage is, those kind of things. But we have some things in place um, from a farm credit system standpoint, as far as some disaster assistance program. So um, once we kind of figure out where you're at, if you need help with that, you can talk to your lending officer around that. But FEMA has some um, programs available. FSA has programs available. I think the biggest thing for people to understand is once they get through through their harvest, and analyze where they're at because they've gotten a ton of government payments for 2020. They need to understand where they're at financially and then make some decisions and decide, okay, am I struggling with my working capital? Do I need to replace some livestock? Um, <clears throat> do I want to take some of my um, equity that I have in ground and, and rebuild some of my, my cash? What do I want to do there? And I think it's very important to analyze and then determine what's best for me, not just for 2021, but for maybe the next five years and what does that look like? So we have a lot of programs in place, but again, it's very operational specific. So what's right for me might not be right for Sam, might not be right for Mike, might not be right for Chelsea, right? So we have to analyze all of those, but there's so many programs in place and we're here to help see producers through times like this. We're not here to um, say, you know, oh, well, we don't know what to do. We have programs in place. They're not just for a duratio, they're for any time that we have um, a terrible, uh, you know, snowstorm or uh, tornadoes, those kind of things that would go through as well. So there's a lot of different avenues that you can take. It's, it just needs to be analyzed and then determine what your path is. And I, I would maybe add here too that uh, farm credit and, and our, our local banks, uh, ag lenders have been, 2020, they've already been very, and, and frankly, the last several years have been working with producers it's not like we woke up and, and just this is the first time that, that folks are trying to think about how to manage their, their finances this year, you know, to, to try to, to generate and, and, and protect and maintain uh, operating capital, working capital. That's been something that, that I know that lenders have been thinking a lot about here and working with producers. So that's just something if, if you aren't doing that, you need to be and, uh, and spot on. You know, I get asked a lot to make kind of blanket statements about how are people doing? Well, everybody's balance sheet is different. Every operation is different and uh, spot on. You've got to, you've got to be working with your lender. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for that. Um, one major thing, and I think Krista kind of touched on it was the FEMA programs. Um, I got right. Got family that's living and breathing this derecho. Mm-hmm. What are those programs and um, what's involved in them and how can they, um, you know, apply for that type of stuff? Anybody want to touch on that? Um, well, you know, from a, so I, 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 from a FEMA standpoint, uh, you know, not, not, not necessarily in my, in my wheelhouse, um, 
uh, other than I know that it's important to rural and urban residents all across the damaged area. So that's, I know that's critically important. And, and uh, you know, uh, the governor and, and the Homeland Security and Emergency Management team has been working, you know, a lot of that is you have to prove up the damage so you can yep. you know, get the designation, presidential designation. We've had secretarial disaster declarations granted by USDA for both derecho and drought. That opens uh, the doors to some of those existing um, uh, you know, damage, uh, uh, disaster programs that are already, that are permanent disaster programs. We still think, I still think that they're, because of some of that conversation around those uninsured losses, there's a precedent that we think that, you know, we're at WIP, WIP plus, uh, you know, the concept of wildfire, hurricane, uh, uh, flood damaged areas where you, you top up the crop insurance payment to try to offset some of those uninsured costs um, or expenses. We think that that is fitting in this case, both in the extreme drought area and in the derecho area, uh, but that would take congressional action. So there's really no, no news there yet. Um, and so, you know, in terms of those, any additional disaster assistance right now from USDA, it's sort of the traditional uh, approaches. And we're still thinking about and working with the congressional delegation on what might some additional uh, disaster assistance look like. Awesome. Thank you, Mike. Um, kind of another big thing, and I think we've touched on a little bit of it is, what is the meaning for yield in some of these spots mm -hmm. of derecho, um, of impacted fields? What are farming, farmers having to do? And what is the bright spot? <laughs> what is the bright spot for some of these guys that literally had to bury their corn um, and just cultivate right over top of it? Um, I will never forget my brother walking out to our test plot and literally taking the ear of corn and touching end to end just because it was, it, it was done. Um, what is the bright spot for these guys going forward? Oh, a bright spot in this, I, you know, hard, hard to say other than, you know, again, uh, uh, agriculture people tend to be optimists, the eternal optimists as Sam, I think alluded to, uh, uh, we hope and, and, uh, you know, there, this is a tough financial go for a lot of folks and, and, and part of what, what all of this assistance, whether it's CFAP or, you know, related to coronavirus food assistance program, or what might come in the form of disaster assistance is all about, it's not about making people whole. It never can be about making people whole. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about trying to bridge to 2021. And, uh, you know, we can still be optimistic about the opportunities to be profitable and productive well into the future. Uh, that all remains true. And there was some talk about, you know, what's happening in the global markets and with domestic demand. And so that's where you can still be optimistic. But I think right now, yield wise, you know, it's, it's all across the board uh, um, in those damaged high wind areas. And we know there were really kind of two distinct mm -hmm. pathways. It doesn't matter what brand or hybrid you had, it's bad. And, uh, and then you get into some of those other areas where, yeah, you got some differences from field to field. And, and, uh, you know, uh, again, we had a good crop out there. I'm hearing everything from it. I might be able to pick up 60 bushels an acre, or maybe I can pick up as much as 200 an acre, just depending. And you've got reels and, and uh, those types of things going on. You've got, you know, combines. Really, I'm hearing if you don't have guidance on your combine, uh, uh, you're, you're really struggling to get through. And then you're seeing some incredible things I saw in Benton County. Uh, right <laughs> off Highway 30 on Wednesday, I saw two combines working at an angle in a field. And yeah. Sam, I think you alluded to it. I, if I hadn't been running late to the next thing, I think I would have whipped in there and said, I got to ride along because I kind of wanted to see what that looks like. I, I, um, but folks are going to get creative. Um, you know, farmers are innovative. They're going to go out and pick it up if they need to. And, uh, and then, like I said, we want to preserve that ability to, though, have fields zeroed out if they should be. And if there should not be an attempt made or if it's not worth going out, then absolutely those fields should be zeroed out. And, and I think we're largely seeing that play out. Definitely. Sam, Krista, anything to add to that? You know, I, I didn't take quite as many tours through the state as Secretary Nag did, but uh, there was one time when I took the family out and uh, just driving along through there. And sometimes I would just look from one side of the road to the other and I would just mm -hmm. tell my wife, I can't believe they're going to have to harvest that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and some of it, I, I prayed they weren't going to have to harvest it and they were just busy somewhere else. Um, the other aspect is um, how many grain carts of um, enormous size have we seen for sale along some of these rural highways? And, and 
I mean that sincerely. Mm -hmm. uh, there are people out there that said, I don't have a need to have this green card available to me anymore. I might have finished up in, you know, in a couple of days because there wasn't anything left to harvest. And so uh, you look at some of the equipment out there and maybe they're maybe they're trying to find some of the ways to be able to provide that cash flow. And maybe they realize and they took another look at, you know, their asset levels. And I think that's the whole aspect of farm management, especially when you think about what this year meant, what do I really need to do on my individual operation? What's the best optimization path for me from this point forward, everything else that's in the past is in the past. We learn from it. It's, guided us to where we're at. It's given us a, you know, a range of experiences that we can take going forward. But what do we need to do going forward? Is there, is there something else that we need to be able to look for sharing equipment later on that maybe we can, we can provide those grain carts. Maybe we don't need that extra grain cart right now. Um, and, and for some of them, you know what, next year I might need it. Uh, you just, everybody's in a different boat mm -hmm. and we all have to understand that everybody needs to take a close look at everything that comes together from financial to risk management to on-farm operations uh, there are people right now i mean some changes in the hog industry uh, some people that may not be able to put that next uh, you know that next group of pigs into the barn uh, you know there's a lot of changes and, and we all have to be ready for what those changes may mean for our individual operations and for our industries that we're a part of I may jump in here uh, and, and with one other point and Sam, good, good um, encapsulation of that. But I think that Chelsea, your point about, you know, going out and tilling under, um, mm -hmm. I think there's, there's something else I wanted to reference that, you know, there's a timeliness to all of this, right? And that's something we keep saying with, with the crop insurance process is if a field is going to be zeroed out, well, let's get it done. You know, ideally you'd have been able to get out and, and start to manage that that significant amount of residue that, that was in that field all the way back to the beginning of September, because of course, you're gonna have a lot of volunteer corn. If we can get that corn uh, on the ground and get it to germinate, that helps you as you look at, at 2021. Um, if those decisions are delayed, um, now you're looking at, well, you know, here we are mid, mid to late October and my options aren't as good as they were, especially in terms of getting that, that corn on the ground to, to germinate. So. Uh, you know, that's been, again, a mantra all along is can't, you know, timeliness matters. Oh, by the way, it also matters as I go work with my lender to know what my claim process, claims process is, because the sooner I can get down the path of knowing what, what this year looks like from a financial standpoint, I can start to think about next year. Secretary, yeah, Nat, just, do you remember, oh, oh, sorry, I was going to just say, ahead, Secretary Nat, do you remember last year when we talked about having to put uh, grain that had come out of bins? Uh, with uh -huh. the flooding and how much we could put back into the ground. It's again, yes. it, it's a matter of how do you manage through everything you're faced with to be able to look at going forward. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and just to that point, Sam, I think it's the bright spot that I see is it might implement some changes that needed to happen a long time ago that are now, because of what we have seen with the duratio, we might we're going to implement them, but maybe they should have been done a while ago um, on certain operations and those kind of things. So from that standpoint, um, our farmers are absolutely resilient. They, you know, the good thing is, is that you get to start over, right? You get to start over next year. So maybe you, you do make some changes, you have a little bit different outlook for next year, but you, you get that opportunity, or for the most part, most people get that opportunity. So from that standpoint, it's, maybe making those changes to um, take into effect all of the things that have happened and then move forward with it versus sometimes we continue to do things the same way or stay status quo. This might make us move the needle a little bit. Definitely. Um, I call my dad a creature of habit because that is, that is what he is. It is, it is full fledged in their, in their blood as a farmer. Um, kind of going back to kind of Krista's point and going into next year, do you guys feel like this is going to take some of our small, you know, small town, farmers that only run about 300 acres out of their business. Do you guys feel like generational farmers are going to be very impacted by this? I think everybody's been impacted by this. I think the aspect we've got is again, that resiliency and looking at what aspects you've got available for your farm, you know, for some of these aspects and the secretary Nag has heard this from me. Um, I don't know how many times and I'll say it again. We need to have real broadband access for high speed internet. Uh, <laughs> And Amen. Yes. <laughs> I, I, 
I've brought this up so many times. He probably knows that I'm just stuck on repeat. Uh, but it, it's one of those aspects that when we think about uh, what a lot of farms in Iowa have done, they've found some off-farm income, whether that's a part-time job or somebody from the family going off for a full-time job or both members of the family going for a full-time job. The parents, uh, you know, maybe they're finding some other way to be able to uh, uh, integrate to bring uh, that, you know, that strong rural economy, entrepreneurial spirit, spirit to bear. Um, and, and for a lot of producers in rural Iowa, it's important that they have access to the technology, one, for their farm, and two, to look at other uh, enterprises that they could be able to take part of or, or roles that they could fill that would bring in off-farm income. So if you don't have that high-speed internet available on the farm, it's going to put you at a disadvantage to so many others. And we've got to be able to level that playing field so that we can um, have that. I mean, if I look up right now from this computer monitor and I will see the legacy goals for the Iowa Farm Bureau Federation. And it's so important because part of those deal with the impact and the economic vitality that farms bring mm -hmm. to their rural communities. And that's part of that aspect of making sure that we've got the technology available so that we can move forward into that next generation of activity that's so vital for Iowa. It's huge. Yes, definitely. We have all this such high tech equipment that we just can't get rural broadband. It's just mind boggling. So, yeah, definitely. Um, kind of one of the big things I, I know all of us were big ad advocates. And that's I mean, we we live and breathe it every day. Why should not agriculture communities be um, be kind of concerned about this and about the derecho? And what is the future of agriculture? Um, what should not agriculture communities feel? This. That's a good. That's a good question. I'm glad. And, and you know, let's let's go even broader and, and just and pull in um, something that I hope is a takeaway from 2020 for all of us. Right? 2020 unprecedented impact on every life, every one of our lives. Doesn't matter if what what where you live or or what you do. Um, Agriculture has not been immune from that by any means. Go back and think about what was happening in the grocery store. Uh, back in April, May, June, right? Mm -hmm. Did you ever really think? Now, we, those of us in agriculture know, and we, we know that there could be a disruption. It's, it's very possible to have a disruption in the supply chain that could result in less choice for consumers. But I think in our daily life, we just don't necessarily think, I, I expect to be able to walk into Fairway and have bananas in February and have multiple choices of apples in January, right? That, you know, th food just arrives at that grocery store and, and magically, and I walk out with it. Well, we know that's not the case. And we saw, it's not just toilet paper that was the problem, right? It was milk and eggs and limited on meat and some of those other things, right? That was because of a supply chain disruption. Lots of reasons, some of it processing, some of it just transportation, some of it just flat out demand. But why should you care? Why should the non-ag community care about that? Well, ultimately it's about whether or not you've got, you need on that grocery store shelf or at the pump. And, and that ultimately is what you should care about as a non-ag community. But the other piece in Iowa, of course, is the fact that, that uh, we are an agriculture-driven economy. It's a huge piece. It's the backbone. It's the, it's the core foundation of what we do. We do a lot of things really well in this state, but agriculture is at the core of that. And so when you think about the economic health of our state and what it means, all the things that we do as a, together as a community, education, infrastructure, getting successful broadband extension, rural prosper, rural economic prosperity, wherever you live. Um, those are things that we do together. And if we don't have a thriving economy, then we can't do those things. And if we don't have a thriving agriculture, we don't have a thriving economy. So, uh, you know, it's a twofold in my mind from a consumer, which every one of us is, I think, I hope everybody already had breakfast this morning. If not, go get that, have some, you know, get something good for the day, but you ate this morning or you will. And that's just flat out from a consumer standpoint. That's why the food and agriculture supply chain matters. But, but you should also think about and be concerned about how's our, how's our farm community doing, both in light of a COVID impact and when disasters like this strike. Um, I, I think that's why folks in the non-ag community can and should care. And by the way, remember, these are people. And we've talked, you, it's been mentioned many times, the stress, the mental stress, the the the, the long hours, the, you know, the, the hard work, um, those are all things that I just on a personal level, I hope people care about that as well. 
Awesome. We had one question, guys, come through. Um, it says, uh, is there any formal research being done to see what structures did stand up for the storm or to mm -hmm. see if there was any resiliency lessons to learn or if it was just random? Anybody want to touch on that? Well, I, and if somebody knows specifically, I'm all ears, but I, I don't know of at a specific effort, although I will tell you that if I'm a, if I'm a grain bin company, I'm going to go out and figure out what happened, right? If I'm a machine shed company, I'm going to want to understand what happened. Um, so I believe those things are happening and, and will happen um, in terms of a, you know, a, a formal coordinated effort. I'm not, I'm not aware of any, but um, yeah, I, I think there'll be things to learn about how to build better. And again, I, I think there's, uh, I, I, I hesitate to use this language because this was a disaster, right? But there are some very, very interesting things that happen around the storm itself. Um, and, and what does the satellite imagery and the radar returns, you know, what, there is a tremendous amount of data that has been generated about the storm itself and how can we better predict um, you know, what actually happened. Our climatologist is working with NASA and some others to try to bring some more. I think we will, I think we will learn some things about just what happened from a weather standpoint, in addition to what happened uh, on the ground. So I think those will be uh, very, very interesting things that come out of it. Disasters often bring about advances in research and information when you think about uh, tornadoes, when you think about fires, when you think about earthquakes, all of those things together let you expose what shortcomings may be in design structures, in material uh, engineering, all sorts of other factors. So without a doubt, this, this event and the widespread nature and impact of it, even though it took a long time for people on the coast to know what had happened back over here, it will be something that is definitely uh, brought up when they start to think about how do we design and build facilities and what do they need to withstand or be able to withstand on a on a regular basis out through there. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Um, we've been talking a lot about storm. I mean, that's kind of what this topic was. But I do have to ask, just because I'm a livestock girl over here, um, with COVID-19 really impacting, and I think Secretary of Agriculture kind of said it, we didn't have state fair this year. For yeah. Iowa, that is a huge, huge thing. Um, and I mean, everybody. Um, and just having that kind of different impact um, and through 4-H and through FFA and having those kids still involved in those programs, what does 2021 look like? What, what do you think it's going to be? I want to bring up something really quick, Mr. Secretary, before you jump in here, because I know you're so good. But I, I want to toot that horn for you first, because I was on a call when Secretary Nag said, if we're not going to have a state fair, I want to make sure that we have an opportunity for our 4-H and FFA members to be able to actively go forward and to have a positive experience. And I want to thank Secretary Nag and everybody else who was engaged at still having shows and having that availability for those 4-H and FFA members, whether it be from Iowa State University with the extension program up there and, and for the secretary and for the deputy secretary. I, I was on that call when he said, this is important. And as a father of 10, it was very important to our family. And, and when I came into Iowa, we said we're a 4-H loving family, and it's true. But I want to mm -hmm. thank the secretary for putting that as an emphasis area going forward. Well, look, I would like to second you. that as well. a parent. <laughs> yes. That's very, Thanks. very important in our family. We show a lot of cattle, and I had a senior in high school this year. And if she would not have gotten to have her last state fair, Right. Um, I'm not quite sure how we would have approached that. So right. uh, kudos to everybody, uh, Secretary. Thank you so much for that because um, you made some kids days. Yeah. Look, well, look, that was an effort of, look, first of all, heartbreaking not to have the great Iowa State Fair. Nothing compares, truly nothing compares. There's some good <laughs> state fairs out there, but there is nothing like the Iowa State <laughs> Fair. And, uh, you know, it is heartbreaking. And the team at uh, the, the fair, uh, the staff, the fair board, they love the fair and uh, it, it's heartbreaking. That was a heartbreaking decision, heart wrenching decision that, that had to be made. And yet, obviously, there was a tremendous amount of support and, and effort on the part of the board and the state fair team to make those livestock shows happen. And across the state, don't forget, we had a lot of county fairs that were not, they didn't look 
like they normally look, and yet they were still able to be uh, those livestock shows. And, you know, uh, uh, we, we're a big baseball family. And my, I got three boys. We played baseball this summer. You know, those are things that we needed that. We needed some something normal, something in a way that was done appropriately and safely, all that, but but something that needed to be done, especially for those individuals like your daughter, uh, like those seniors who had one last shot at this. And I, I just, I couldn't imagine not letting those folks do that. Now, all, everybody who did a show and go though at a fair, no, don't get used to that. We're going <laughs> to have to move in and stay at the fair because that we're just not going to allow that to happen. Uh, I, I think that kudos to Iowa state extension, every, every County fair board, the state fair board, uh, you know, look, that took a lot of folks. Um, mm -hmm wanting to get on board and willing to get on board and and uh, doing some things different but hey i got to get out and see some of those shows i gotta tell you i never saw i've never seen people as happy and as just as relieved and happy and enjoying themselves as i saw this year at some at those livestock shows across the state that's awesome thank you so much and i i mean I was telling Sam, Sam and I kind of actually figured out that we kind of knew each other and he judged me at the Iowa State Fair one year and um, in the sheep show and I was like, oh my God, I'm like a small world. And so I know I, and to Krista's point, I mean, if I, if I was still showing at this time, which has been a long, been a long time, um, I mean, it, it just a tremendous amount of effort and just tremendous gratefulness for you because it's, um, those kids that wanted to be part of that and that's all they live and breathe all summer you yep. shoot Krista we cattle all year I mean that's what you guys do all year so we appreciate it um, guys we're just wrapping up here um, I want to thank you guys so much for being a part of this panel I truly appreciate it kind of said at the beginning this this topic is near and dear to my heart lived and breathe it just like you guys did um, and I want to appreciate you thank you so much again guys for being part of this panel reminder guys um, anybody that's still here that this is actually being recorded. It will be um, on iyideas.com here actually post event. Thank you to the panel. Thank you to the audience. Um, and we will see you guys next time. Thank you. Thanks. Thank Thanks you. Guys.